Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, uh, the first, uh, the, the second panel actually, um, and uh, start off with introducing the monitor, uh, the, the moderator, and that is uh, uh, John Altman, who is the senior vice president. Uh, he holds the uh, Brzezinski chair for the global security and geo strategy, and is the director of the Middle East program uh, at the at CSIS. He's been at CSIS for uh, about 20 years. Uh, and prior to that, uh, he was with the State Department and near and near to my heart. Uh, he was a member of the uh, Chief of Naval Operations uh, Executive Panel for 10 years, hopefully bolstering up all the Marine programs there, sir. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, Dr. Alterman, I am I'm pleasure to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, I wanna recognize three tremendous old friends and colleagues uh, on my panel. I don't know, you, you, you couldn't have known Mike, how long my association uh, and admiration for the members of my panel is. Uh, first, we'll start off with Ebtissam of Ketbi, who I, have, I feel like I've known, I, I can't remember what I didn't know Ebtissam. Ebtissam has been a pathbreaker uh, among Middle East experts in the United Arab Emirates. She's the founder and president of the Emirates Policy Center and the first Arab woman to lead a think tank. She's a professor, a longtime professor of political science at the United Arab Emirates University and a member of the Consultative Commission of the Gulf Cooperation Council. She serves on a very wide number of boards and was a member of the core team behind the 2006 Arab Human Development Report. She's also a founding member of the Emirates Human Rights Association. <coughs> so Ebtissam is going to give us a little bit of a view of how the region, which is very close to Iran, the countries especially on the southern end of the Gulf. Think about Iran, think about um, security dialogues with Iran and, and what it means to really live in the shadow of Iran. We'll then go to Bilal Saab, uh, who's senior fellow and director of the Defense and Security Program at the Middle East Institute. He's currently completing a book, <coughs> excuse me, entitled Rebuilding Arab Defense, America's Quest for Military Partnership in the Middle East which will be published later this year. Prior to joining the Middle East Institute, he was the Pentagon's senior official focused on security cooperation in the Middle East <coughs> in the office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. He's a veteran of many of the most influential think tanks in DC, including CSIS, the Atlanta Council Brookings, and what used to be the Monterey Institute Center for Nonproliferation Studies, and he was an international affairs fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he's gonna talk um, about if there is a nuclear deal between the US and Iran, but there isn't a US commitment to addressing Iran's missile program and its proxies in the region, or if there's not progress on that, what are the options that US allies in the Gulf have? Uh, then we're going to move to Martin Indyk. If there's somebody who is legendary on this program, it is Martin. Uh, I can't remember when I didn't know Martin's reputation. He is currently a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He had a long and distinguished career at the Brookings Institution, where he was the executive vice president and the vice president of the Foreign Policy Program and the founder and head of what was when he created it, the Saban Center for Middle East Policy. Prior to that, he played a central role, if not the central role in the Clinton administration's Middle East policy, serving as the senior director for the Middle East and South Asian affairs on the NSC, assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern affairs and twice as ambassador to Israel. Prior to that, he was the founding executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East policy. Um, Martin is going to talk about how things look from an Israeli perspective uh, and especially how the different moving parts uh, of U.S. Middle East policy affect Israeli strategic thinking. So why don't we start with Ebtissam, we'll move to Bilal, we'll move to Martin, and then we'll have a, a more open discussion. So Ebtissam, thank you very much for joining us from, from the UAE, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you, John. It's my pleasure to be with you. and. Uh... Thanks for Kansas University for this invitation. And I'm really uh, happy to be with all this distinguished uh, colleague. Uh, John, I think, uh, listening to the previous speakers before us, 
I think the people in the West, they still, they don't know or do understand the Iran impasse. Uh, it's, it is not exaggeration to say that Iran's uh, pursuit of regional he hegemony has come to represent an increasingly complicated and uh, interactable dilemma. Iran has neither succeeded in its aim nor abandoned this destructive uh, strategy. Amidst an increasingly international sense of the need to find a solution to Iran impasse as soon as possible, several attempts have been made. However, all of these efforts have failed to, to tame or rehabilitate uh, the Iranian regime because all of these um, efforts have uh, uh, ignored the strategic detriments related to Tehran hegemonic project and the nature of the political regime uh, leading this project. The failure of the nuclear deal reflects its neglect of the strategic detriments that governs Iran perception of itself and, and the world around it as the country with imperialistic and uh, doctrinal uh, motivation. It was also over optimistic uh, in its estimation of Tehran desire to reach cooperative regional solution. Regional approaches to solve the Iranian impasse have also not taken into account the uh, duplicity of, of the ruling regime in Tehran, nor the nature of relation between the government and the deep states, uh, rendering them hollow, superficial, and, and based on proposal for uh, pacification and, and good uh, will only. Regional initiatives to solve Iran's uh, impasse, such as uh, the Qatari and, and Kuwaiti initiative, have uh, points of weakness these initiatives lack uh, a strategic perspective of Iran's issue and don't take uh, the regional nature of the crisis into uh, account. They are almost uh, limited to, to the desire to solve the impasse and, and, and good will. Now, maybe the time has come to start a direct dialogue among regional actors without mediation. Uh, this, however, does not represent uh, a call for a bilateral uh, dialogue between uh, each individual country in the region and Iran, because this will not uh, often serve regional stability. This is uh, quite true given the huge imbalance uh, of power between countries and, and the dim chances of finding solutions to any controversial uh, issues. There is no doubt that outside Iran, the Arab Gulf countries suffer most from the ongoing uh, stalemate. Iran's closest neighbor are seen as a threat for its expansionist projects where it can create leverage with which to pressure the international community and especially Washington. Uh, and yet it is, it is no secret that GCC nature, sorry, nations fear that they may be doomed to repeat the experience of the nuclear deal as international parties continue to ignore their interests while in effect permitting Tehran to marginalize them. And uh, I think they, they, they are upset that they, were, they are not there in, in uh, Vienna. The Arab also fear that Washington's abandonment of dialogue in favor of uh, out, uh, out, uh, outsourcing a solution to regional partners may undermine essential engagement with Iran by restricting any cooperation to bilateral basis or at best purely regional negotiations 
without international supervisions or auspices. This necessarily means that this pursuit will not lead to the desired outcomes. So with this concern in the mind, uh, international community and GCC countries must devise innovative initiative to resolve the impasse before it reaches the point of no uh, return. If it is still impossible to reach a comprehensive resolution of all uh, outstanding issues due to the to the uh, uh, attitude may may open the door instead <clears throat> to regional negotiation on matters that concern the international community and, and, and the Arab region alike. This uh, initiative, however, should take into consideration the strategic determinants that have prevented stakeholders from reaching uh, a practical solution of, of the issue uh, thus far, such uh, a regional initiative should enable major world powers and bodies, including uh, United States, the UN Security Council, and, and others uh, uh, to oversee negotiations. Their involvement could ensure the implementation of outcomes and encourage adherence to the resulting agreement by adapting <clears throat> supportive UN resolution that include the use of flexible uh, legal instruments. The, the international community must concede a, a, a pivotal role to the GCC countries as those most affected by Iran missile program and expansionist uh, agenda and its malign activities. It should support the launch of a regional dialogue on outstanding uh, issues that it's uh, convened under the umbrella of the United Nation and benefits from strong international oversight and support. The realities on the ground indicate that all stakeholders are willing to join negotiations regardless of their sponsor. Therefore, the, the sponsors of that dialogue along with GCC countries and their supporters should avoid the strategic mistakes of, of the past that have prevented effective solutions to the impasse. The international community should avoid overly simplistic interpretation of Iran political system as the reason that prevented uh, effective solution to the uh, stalemate thus far. To conclude, this new approach should improve links with the centers of power in the country that have genuine leverage regarding controversial uh, issues. And awareness of strategic determinants should be sufficient to move beyond half measures and a sterile solution to forge a genuine resolution of uh, Iran's crisis. Thank you. Dr. Sam, thank you very much. There's a lot I want to, to unpack there, a lot of really interesting ideas, but I, I want to go to, to Bilal and the question, I mean, Dr. Sam raised really serious concerns that neighbors have, and I think embedded in that is a concern that the U.S. will take care of its principal priorities, but not the principal priorities of some of the neighbors. How will the neighbors respond to that? How should the neighbors respond to that? Bilal? Thank you, John. And uh, thank you to the organizers. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with such uh, friends, old friends, as you said, uh, John. Um, and some of what I'm going to say is oh, it's going to overlap a little bit with uh, what Ibtissam had just said. Um, so yeah, so the assumption is if there is a nuclear deal, right, and um, uh, no meaningful progress on uh, some of the concerns that you just raised, uh, John, whether it's the uh, missile program or the proxy network of Iran, uh, what are some of the options that, uh, let's just limit it to Saudi Arabia for now, because uh, I'm not going to speak for all the countries since we only have 10 minutes. Um, what are the options that the Saudis have uh, then? 
Uh, I think they have three options and I don't really think that they're mutually exclusive. Uh, and let me name them and I'll, uh, I'll very briefly discuss the pros and cons of each. So the first one is what Ipti Sam was just talking about is why don't we just, you know, get into a regional security dialogue or a bilateral dialogue with the Iranians and see what we can uh, get out of it. So that's just one option. Uh, second one is uh, closer relations with the Chinese and the Russians, right? Which, which by default would mean a downgrading of relations with the Americans. Um, and the third one is stronger political ties and security ties, uh, ideally with the Israelis and the Emirates, right? Those are the three options. I would have added a fourth, John, but uh, I, I don't think it rises to the level of a strategic option, which is, which is an old idea, which is GCC unity, right? Uh, so uh, a stronger uh, body uh, in the Gulf that could serve uh, as sort of a deterrent against uh, the Iranians. I'm not going to treat it as an option because we all recognize the challenges there. We all recognize how hard they've tried for many years and it just hasn't worked. And I don't think it will work anytime soon because of geography, because of threat perceptions and how they view Iran, because of um, uh, tensions and, um, uh, and those are not new. So let me talk about very briefly the first option, which is this regional security dialogue or a bilateral dialogue. Um, you know, in principles, all the regions, uh, all the countries in the region are in favor of it. That's in principle. Uh, and also we've made some statements uh, in favor of that. I think um, uh, Joe Biden has mentioned that he wanted a stronger and, uh, and, uh, uh, and a more uh, lasting deal with the Iranians, which means consulting with the, uh, with the Gulf states and the Israelis. Uh, in his confirmation speech, uh, Tony Blinken also had similar words about it. I mean, uh, the Russians themselves have also had, Sergei Lavrov has mentioned several times, uh, I would say even over the past 15 years, have they've, you know, they've advocated for a regional security dialogue. Uh, and he just mentioned that recently in March of this year, uh, Lavrov, uh, that is. Um, but here's why it's just, there's just so many significant challenges uh, or roadblocks to, to this concept. Uh, one, those who are most aggressively calling for it, that's the Iranians, they want it for all the wrong reasons. Um, those who are probably going to benefit the most from it, and that's the Saudis, are hesitant to take part for the very reasons that Ibtissam has just mentioned. Um, those who probably would play the most instrumental role in such a process, and that's us, the Americans, we're busy with other priorities. Uh, and we're very much unclear about our level of commitment uh, to our regional friends. And then those who historically have had very little patience for multilateral fora and uh, always prefer to rely on self-defense and play the spoiler role, that's the Israelis. Uh, so I don't know how you score all this to actually get to a regional security dialogue. Um, you know, we'll, we'll keep pretending, right, uh, uh, that we can make this work. But soon enough, you know, our friends in the region we're gonna to have to realize that whatever promises we made uh, regarding addressing their security concerns, uh, whether it's the missiles or the proxy network, I don't think we're gonna be able to honor, uh, at least in ways that are satisfactory to them. The second option is the closer relations with the Russians and the Chinese. Okay, so if I'm Washington, I wouldn't really poo poo this, uh, at least a lot. Uh, there are limits to this for sure, uh, because the Saudis still need us to maintain their equipment at least the ones that they have currently, and they need our advice on defense reform because they're in the process, they're in the, right in the midst of a very ambitious and extensive process of defense reconstruction or, or, re, uh, or, or transformation. So they need us for that. Uh, but the point I wanna make is that even the slightest attempt uh, by the Saudis to provide greater military intelligence or economic access to the Chinese and the Russians uh, would make us nervous. Uh, all we do right now is great power competition. I don't need to remind anybody on this forum. Uh, that is our constitution in the Pentagon. So even the smallest inroads uh, by the Chinese into the region will, at least in the minds of US decision makers uh, in Washington, challenge this number one foreign policy priority. Uh, this also might mean, uh, if the Saudis really are in a vengeful mood, uh, uh, limiting access to us, You know how we're postured in the kingdom, where our personnel are allowed to go, uh, what personal gear uh, they're allowed to carry, what protection they're given, all of these things, all this bureaucratic jujitsu that the 
Saudi, uh, the Saudis could uh, uh, pursue could make our lives very difficult in terms of at least military presence uh, in the kingdom. Now, of course, the big question is, would the Chinese or the Russians be interested in such an opening? Uh, can they actually absorb uh, such an opening? Uh, probably not at the level of our presence uh, because they have other priorities, obviously, uh, the Chinese in the Indo-Pacific and then the Russians uh, in their own neighborhood. Uh, you know, uh, Putin is not about to forget about Ukraine and Georgia all of a sudden to start deploying Russian troops in the Saudi desert. The same for Beijing, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're not going to forget about the China Sea or Taiwan. Uh, but even if the Saudis start buying, let's say, hardware that's not interoperable with us, uh, that's a big blow to the partnership. Uh, that's, you know, if you, if you recall when the Saudis were even contemplating, it wasn't a serious contemplation, but they were just thinking about buying uh, Russian S-400 anti-missile uh, systems. And I remember because I was in the Pentagon, we were unequivocal with our warnings to the Saudis that if you do that, it probably would be worse than the day after 9-11. We sent very stern warnings to the Saudis, and they understood it, which is why they opted for the THAAD uh, system. I'm not sure we can continue to do that if we continue to ignore their security concerns, if we can't prevent another app cake. Uh, uh, I, 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 would, I would think that MBS would pick up the phone and call Putin and make a deal on the S-400, all call the Chinese and inquire about, you know, uh, their stealth uh, aircraft if they can't get the F-35. Um, last option, stronger political and security ties with the Israelis. It's good to have a powerful uh, friend in your corner, uh, but there are also risks, as I'm sure the Emirates are perfectly aware of that. Uh, you know, befriending a trigger-happy Israel uh, who's worries about the Iranian theocracy run much deeper than anybody else in the region, including the Saudis. Uh, just puts the Gulf states in a very awkward and potentially dangerous uh, situation. Uh, Israel has no interest whatsoever in sitting at the table and talking to the Iranians uh, about anything. Uh, and of course, the same goes for the Iranians who don't even recognize the Israelis. So if this ongoing conflict uh, between the Iranians and the Israelis at sea, but also on land, escalates, the Iranians are not going to go after the Israelis. They're going to go after first and foremost the Gulf states who are much weaker or more vulnerable. And that's exactly what happened in September of 2019 with the Aramco attack uh, uh, in response, of course, at the time to the Trump administration's uh, uh, sanctions. Uh, they went after the Saudis, certainly not us, certainly not the Israelis. Uh, so there's a reason why the Emiratis are very reluctant to flaunt about the relationship, the blossoming relationship with the Israelis. They don't want to provoke the Iranians. But at the same time, they realize they might get they might get a deterrent out of it, uh, out of this relationship, uh, which is a very difficult balancing act for the Emiratis. Um, I'll say one last thing, John, because I know I've uh, run out of time. A long time ago, the Emiratis have made up their mind and they haven't flinched one bit, which is that we are on Team USA. OK, there's no plan B. There's no alternative. We are with Uncle Sam no matter what. And one of the reasons, and I think Martin, Martin would agree with this, one of the reasons, perhaps not the most important one, but one of the reasons why they've actually gotten closer to the Israelis is because they understand how much we care about Israel. So this is like another tool for them to even get closer to Washington through the Israelis. They might get something out of the Israelis too, but the broader intention here, the broader perspective was that if we get closer to the Israelis, we'll definitely get closer to Uncle Sam. I don't think the Saudis can play that card yet uh, for the very reasons that everybody has talked about already, which is that, you know, MBS is waiting for the king to pass. And after that, maybe he'll be able to normalize with the Israelis. And then he's got a much more difficult and different political position in Washington than the Emirates. And so I don't think the Democrats and progressives will be as keen to welcoming back MBS to Washington as they did, for example, with the Emirates. So those are the options of the Saudis, John. They're not perfect, uh, but, um, and they're certainly limited. Uh, that's what happens when you're a junior partner, when you're a weaker partner. Uh, but nevertheless, they do have them, they have options. Thank you very much. Um, so, and I think one of the, the most nerve wracking pieces of the, the situation you described was that 
the Gulf states, on the one hand, are counting on an Israeli deterrent, but they don't shape Israeli actions in any significant way. And, and I've certainly been on a number of private calls uh, with Israelis, not in the government, but formerly in the government, who have talked quite openly um, about the, the perception that Israel not only needs to preserve the, the, the right to have a, a, an attack on Iran, but the utility of periodic uh, military strikes on Iran to, to help shape Iranian behavior with an intense attack of about 10 days ago, I think being on the low end of that scale and then thinking uh, about things more visible and, and more damaging on the other end of the scale. Martin, you have spent more time than anybody I know uh, talking with senior Israeli security officials about how they see their world and what they might do about it. How do you think Israel looks at the prospect of the U.S. making a deal the US, that, that Israel thinks is misguided? Uh, the Gulf states being concerned, as both Bilal and Sam talked about, about the blowback from uh, an escalation of tensions uh, with Iran and its neighbors wouldn't be on Israel, it would be on the Gulf. How does Israel see that landscape and what options does Israel think it has? And, and, and how does Israel think about the options it has if the US makes what the Israeli leadership concludes is a mistaken deal? Where does that leave Israel in terms of what Israelis, I think, almost uniformly believe is an existential threat to Israel? Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. And, and uh, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, that is to say, the Israeli uh, perception of Iran as an existential uh, threat. Um, that's not just because of Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions, which the Israelis are totally convinced of, but it's also because uh, for a long time, not so much recently, but, but certainly from time to time, and certainly coming out of the mouth of the Supreme Leader, there have been clear threats to Israel's existence issued by the Iranian leadership. Uh, and um, the first role of a government when a country threatens to destroy you is to take it seriously. So they do take, take this, the, the intention uh, to wipe Israel off the map and the desire to acquire nuclear capability uh, to achieve that purpose uh, very seriously. Uh, it fits into their broader nuclear uh, non-proliferation strategy, if we can call it that, which is that uh, for Israel's own survival, and this goes back to history of the, the Jews and the Jewish state, uh, that they will not abide by any other regional power, that is country in the region, acquiring nuclear weapons. And they have gone to quite some lengths to attack the Iraqi nuclear program and the Syrian nuclear program. And they have built uh, a formidable capacity to take on the Iranian nuclear program as well. Um, there's been in the past a lot of question marks over whether the Israelis really could destroy the program. But I think that that discussion has underestimated the way in which the Israelis have gone about building this capacity. And we can see in the recent attacks on Iranian nuclear scientists and the Iranian uh, enrichment facility at Matanz, uh, examples of the uh, multifaceted approach that the Israelis have to this, which is to say that for some years now, I would say for more than a decade, they have been planning not just a kind of conventional preemptive strike as they did in Iraq and Syria, but uh, intelligence operations designed to subvert the nuclear program at every point. Uh, and the attack inside Natanz was a classic example of what the, they have been planning for a long time 
to do. And they've demonstrated time and time again that they have the ability to disrupt Iran's nuclear ambitions um, before they ever get to a, a nuclear weapon. So I think it's, it's important to understand that, that they have a multifaceted approach to what they see as an existential threat. Now, the Iranians uh, have uh, been responding in some ways and, and initiating in other ways, efforts to promote um, their dominance of the region uh, and to challenge Israel in the process of doing so. First of all, through their support of Hezbollah in Lebanon, where they've built up a formidable Hezbollah capacity with some would say 150,000. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> I think it's 15,000. Well, Bilal will tell us exactly, but they have a hell of a lot of missiles in the hands of Hezbollah that can be rained upon Israeli cities. And they have been trying in recent years, uh, the Iranians in particular, been trying to give them precision guided uh, capabilities so that they can hit targets in Israeli cities with accuracy. And, and the war between the wars, as the Israelis describe it, the effort to uh, take on Iran uh, in the Israeli neighborhood, starting with Lebanon, uh, particularly in Syria, um, has uh, been directed in the first instance at preventing Iran from getting that kind of sophisticated missile capability into Hezbollah's hands in Lebanon um, the, to prevent them from being able to target Israeli cities with uh, a large arsenal uh, of missiles. Uh, so the, the existential threat has a particular uh, dimension to it in terms of this missile threat from Lebanon. And it's something which the Israelis always have to consider when they take uh, military action against Iran, uh, that it could trigger uh, uh, missile attacks from Lebanon on Israeli civilian population centers. Uh, there's a kind of mutual deterrence. We can get into that if you want to. Uh, since the, um, the, the collapse of Syria into civil war, the Iranians have become far more active there and have been trying to extend their ability to uh, attack Israel uh, from the Golan Heights, from the Syrian controlled Golan Heights. Uh, so they have Hezbollah capacity in Lebanon. They have a, uh, an effort to try to build a capacity on the Golan Heights in Syria uh, against Israel. And they have also been funding and supplying and training uh, Hamas and particularly Palestine Islamic Jihad in Gaza uh, on Israel's southern border uh, to improve its capabilities to attack Israel as well. So the Israelis see this as a kind of multi-level threat coming across just about every border uh, except for Jordan. And they worry a lot about uh, stability in Jordan as a result. And plus the, the nuclear program and the uh, ballistic missile program, which would give the Iranians the means to deliver their nuclear weapons uh, against Israel, should they ever manage to acquire them. So that is the, Irani the, the, the way that the Israelis look at it. And when they look at how they can deal with this, they view Israel, uh, the United States with a jaundiced eye. They're suspicious of what we uh, have in mind when it comes to trying to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. They know that we share their objective, but uh, the approaches that we have pursued over the years have left them deeply concerned and skeptical that we will succeed through negotiations with Iran in putting meaningful curbs on their nuclear program. And they see the JCPOA, first of all, as a betrayal of them because it was negotiated behind their backs in the first instance. Uh, and secondly, a betrayal in the sense that they see the agreement as actually helping Iran over time to get closer to its nuclear weapons ambitions. 
Uh, they see it in, in a very different way to the way we do. Uh, and therefore, and now that uh, the Biden administration wants to go back into compliance with an agreement which they regarded was a very bad agreement in the first place, um, they are not happy about it. What's happened in between times that I think it's also important to understand is that they have shifted from believing at the time when the first JCPOA agreement was negotiated that Iran was well on its way to acquiring nuclear weapons uh, capability and that uh, the JCPOA, at least for the, some in the national security establishment in Israel, the JCPOA had some tactical advantage in terms of slowing it down. But today, they, much, uh, they have a very different attitude. And that is because they have their own efforts at subverting the program have succeeded to the extent that they now think that Iran is at least two years away from uh, acquiring a nuclear weapons capability. And their message to Washington is, don't be in a hurry to go back to the agreement, slow down, let the maximum pressure of sanctions worse work rather than relieving the sanctions. And so there is, a, there is a new disagreement between the United States and Israel about whether it makes sense to go back to the agreement or hold on to the sanctions and use that as leverage to negotiate the stronger and longer deal, which the Israelis would like to see the administration succeed at that, but they don't think they're going about it the right way. Now, final point about the Abraham Accords and where, where things fit in there. The uh, Israelis definitely see an opportunity to forge an Israeli Sunni Arab uh, axis or alliance against the common threat uh, that the Iranians pose to Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and other Sunni Arab states, uh, and Israel. And uh, the Abraham Accords, while they have an important normalization of relations dimension to it, really have a very important strategic imperative for Israel, which is to, to join together with these Arab states that have traditionally been very hostile to Israel, who are now prepared to work with Israel on the basis that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they have become good friends as a result in terms of coordinating against Iran. However, there is uh, some differences between I I Israel and its would-be Sunni uh, uh, Arab allies. Uh, the Israelis care much more about Iran's nuclear ambitions than the Sunni Arabs do. Uh, maybe Ebtisa can, can explain uh, the difference here, but it is noticeable. The, the, the Sunni Arabs, the UAE and Saudi Arabia in particular, are far more concerned about Iranian subversive activities in the region than they are about its nuclear ambitions. It's not to say they don't care about that so much, but they care much more about the interference of Iran in their neighborhood. And that's more threatening to them. The Israelis uh, see the nuclear program as an existential threat, as I've already explained. So there is this kind of difference. And there is a point that John uh, uh, has made, which is that, that uh, the Israelis provide some deterrent, greater deterrent capability to, to the uh, frontline Arab states that are just across the waterway from Iran. But on the other hand, um, if Israel is taking military action and the Iranians decide to take it out on, on uh, the UAE or Saudi Arabia, uh, that will create some tension between uh, Israel and, and its allies. And that is yet to kind of play itself out fully, but there's a great potential there. And I think that that's why the Emiratis and the Israelis continue to have a, a strong interest in cooperating together. Israel can do a lot to help uh, the UAE build its, its military capabilities. Um, but the idea of military cooperation in which you see Israeli aircraft uh, based in, in uh, Abu Dhabi, seems to me the kind of thing that, that would be a little bit dangerous 
for the Emiratis and beyond where they would be uh, prepared to go, except in a crisis where you could imagine that they, they uh, might see some advantage in that. So I think that, that while the, the strategic imperative of combating Iran is very important to both Israel and uh, the Emirates and the Saudis and the other Sunni Arabs that see Iran as a, as a threat, um, they're going to have to work very carefully and cautiously in terms of the way that they build uh, this alliance. But there's one advantage that this alliance has over the other options that Bilal was talking about, which is Israel is in the neighborhood. Israel has a real sense of how dangerous the Iranians are, shares that sense of threat in a way that none of the outside powers do, including the United States. And that makes the Israelis more reliable as, as an ally to the Gulf Arabs than any external power, including the United States. Thank you to all three of you. You gave a, a lot to work with. I don't think we're gonna have any problem filling up the, the discussion period. You know, Martin, when you were talking about the way the, the Sunni Arab states are, are less concerned uh, with the Iranian nuclear program uh, than they are with subversion, I still remember a conversation I had several years ago with a Kuwaiti foreign minister at the time who said, if somebody already has a gun pointed at your head, what does it matter that they put a cannon pointed at your back? I mean, the Iranians already have enough capacity that the, 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 the Sunni Arab states feel the nuclear stuff doesn't change the whole equation. In a way, this is very different from, I think, the way the Israelis see it. I think that the first thing, there's a lot I want to talk about. The first thing uh, is this question of, of are there, is there any circumstance arising out of the JCPOA negotiations where Israel would would likely feel a need to act in a way to really frustrate the United States, undermine the United States, create daylight with the United States because Israel feels that, that the US is acting recklessly. Is, is, is the overall relationship strong enough that Israel will grumble and, and uh, and complain, but not actively obstruct? Or can we imagine a circumstance in which Israel would actively try to obstruct? And then I think the question is, what then would, would US allies in the Gulf do as a consequence? So when we start- oh, I think we, sorry, we already have an example of that last week. I don't think that, that uh, Washington was aware uh, or particularly welcome. Uh, the way in which the Israelis had bombed the Natanz facility right at the time when they're trying to negotiate uh, indirectly with the Iranians uh, an arrangement to, re to return to the JCPOA. Uh, uh, you know, my sense is that wasn't particularly coordinated with the American side and, and it had the potential to disrupt the negotiations. Now, as it turns out, it had the exact opposite effect. Uh, I think the, Israel the Iranians calculated that, that the Israelis were actually trying to disrupt the negotiation. So they decided they, they would continue it just to screw the Israelis. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that that is going to be a continued uh, tension, source of tension between the United States uh, and Israel. Because as I said, it's not just about um, going back to what they regard as a bad deal. But it's also now about lifting sanctions, which the Israelis believe uh, have a useful role in terms of uh, leverage to achieve what the Biden administration says it's objective, which is a, a longer and stronger deal. Um, so there's, there's, there's tactical uh, differences. But the key thing I think that you were getting at, I don't think is gonna happen. That is to say, during the negotiation of the first JCPOA, the Obama administration was very concerned that the Israelis were gonna take military action to basically bomb the facilities. This is like what the Israelis did to the Osirak reactor in the Iraq in the 1980s. Exactly, and there was a real concern about that. Now, as I explained before, the Israelis, they don't, 
Washington doesn't have that concern because the Israelis are saying, they're two years away. We don't need to rush back into the agreement because they're, they're far away from it, partly because of what we've been doing to screw them up. Uh, so there's not that fear. I think the fear uh, of disruption will come from these, these covert operations, uh, which of course the United States has been a partner with Israel to uh, over many of these operations. The Stuxnet cyber attack uh, on the centrifuges was the most obvious uh, one in which the United States and Israel work together, although it seems the Israelis got a bit ahead of us on that. So, uh, but it's, the tension is definitely there. And uh, Biden administration is doing its best to learn from the past and, and to kind of put their arms around the Israelis. The leaders of the Israeli national security establishment are coming to town uh, next week for intensive consultations. Um, there's a commitment there to try to work with Israel on this. Uh, and a sense that, you know, in the end, they share the common objective of preventing Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Um, but, but it's going to be a constant push and pull between the two, these two allies on this issue. And, and I want to ask if this time, Bilal, two questions that came out of Martin's response. One is, is how did you perceive that the neighbors thought about the Natanz attack? Um, and also this issue of, of sanctions relief. Is this something that, that countries in the region are worried about? Is it something they agree about it's in principle, but think it's early and it should go slowly? I mean, so let's start with Natan's attack. What did, what did you perceive from your contacts uh, in regional governments? Was this a, a welcome uh, occurrence or was it uh, worrying or was it just something that you can't control? So it's like the weather, you just deal with it. If to Sam, why don't you start? Well, I think um, with regard to the environmental issue also, this is, very, I mean, people look at it very dangerous because just uh, close to Kuwait and close to us. From other hand, that uh, the, the fear that that might trigger to uh, a, a war, regional war. And, and, and this is the differences between, I would say that, well, let's talk because from the GCC, it's UAE which has uh, that agreement with Israel. And the difference is in that, that uh, any strike against uh, Iran, we saw when um, Soleimani being killed, the retaliation was against the Saudi on a pig. So that any, as Bilal said, any retaliation will be on the uh, GCC land, it will not uh, it will not go back to Israel or the United States. They are far away from that. So uh, this is the only um, fear from what Nathan's will it trigger uh, after that. Just want to, to mention something which Bilal has mentioned that UAE uh, wanted to, uh, to be more closer to US through Abraham Accord. Uh, no, Bilal. It wasn't that, <laughs> the decision makers. We share with Israel many threats in the region and many similarities. We are both two small countries, okay? Surrounded by many threats from the Iranian, from the extremism, from the Turks. So I think that was a game changer and formed that alliance. And the, even the, the, the Iranian felt uh, sorry that they couldn't make that agreement with their neighbors and they pushed their neighbors to agreement with, with uh, Israel. It wasn't the US was the factor, uh, the dominant factor, it was the threat, which is in the, what happens in the geopolitics. Bilal, do you have any, what's, what's your sense of how, um, how the Natanz attack was received in the Gulf? Yeah, so I mean, we have a couple of samples to look at before John and how they responded whenever there was kinetic actions uh, against the Iranians. I mean, the most glaring example is what happened after we killed Soleimani, right? So they cheered privately, but then they rushed to uh, call for de-escalation and even talks with the Iranians, right? Remember what the Emiratis uh, were. And even sometimes when the Iranians themselves were the aggressors at sea, you remember how often that happened last year, uh, the Gulf states even 
ignore uh, denied the fact that they actually even took place or that the Iranians were the aggressor. Uh, all of that, team. yeah, all of that in the interest of preventing a war from which they would be uh, uh, suffering uh, the most, right? So, you know, if, if something like this happens again, just stay quiet, hope that the Iranians don't strike, uh, but then if they do, absorb it, just like the Saudis absorbed it in Abqaiq. Now, of course, I'm not going to go into all sorts of contingencies. And if there's an all out attack, of course, they'll have the right to uh, mount, you know, uh, a, a response. But in those, you know, uh, uh, um, separate uh, 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 Israeli uh, kinetic uh, courses of actions that hopefully would not escalate and get into a regional war, uh, the, the kinetic option is really not a realistic option for the Gulf states. Uh, uh, not now, not anytime soon. Uh, and and, and Martin is right, is that, that the Israelis will always have a fundamentally different point of view regarding the Iranian nuclear program. But, but I just want to respond to Martin, is that the reason why the Saudis have somewhat greater confidence uh, or fewer concerns about the, uh, about the nuclear program of the Iranians is that somehow deep down, despite all the concerns about our policy, they believe that we're never going to allow the Iranians to get the bomb the world as a whole is not going to allow the Iranians to get the bomb. Somehow they still have some confidence that we would at least get it right on that issue. We might not get it right on the other security concerns that they have, but that's why they feel less worried about that as the Israelis. The Israelis, for all the reasons that Martin just mentioned, feel existentially threatened about it. So they don't even take zero percent, 1% chance that, that we might not get it right. So uh, I, I would urge whoever is listening in this conference that to really uh, uh, um, think very carefully about any significant military cooperation that would take place between the Israelis and the Gulf states. I think that is the Gulf states, specifically the Emiratis, really want to under, uh, 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 um, I would say, uh, de-emphasize this to the extent possible in order not to provoke the Iranians. They keep that as a deterrent option should really everything fall apart, right? And that there is a war and at that point they have a powerful friend in their corner, fine. But absent that, which hopefully we'll never get to, I don't think they're that excited or that reckless to entertain kinetic actions with the Israelis to slow down, limit, disrupt the Iranian nuclear program. I don't think they're interested in that. They appreciate more than anybody else how vulnerable they are. And that vulnerability is going to continue, especially as we are not clear about our level of commitment to their security. So let me talk about that issue of vulnerability and, and how to approach um, the Iranians. There are reports uh, over the weekend that uh, the, the Iranians and the Saudis had high level negotiations at the level of the intelligence minister to try to reduce tensions They're, for a long time. Uh, billions of dollars of trade between the UAE and Iran. Uh, and I think that the, the Gulf instinct has often been you engage with your adversaries, you give them reasons to preserve the relationship rather than, than sanction them. How, Martin said that, that, that Israel thinks now is not the time to let up economic pressure on the Iranians. What's the thinking in the Gulf about relieving economic pressure or using uh, economic incentives to change Iranian behavior. The Israeli argument has been, if you give the Iranians more money, they will destabilize the region more. We heard from Martin that the, 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 country, the Sunni countries care more about destabilizing the region than the bomb. And yet we see the, 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 the move of a lot of regional countries to, to engage with the Iranians? How, how should we untangle that and think about how they think about engagement, trade, lifting some of the sanctions that the Trump administration put on? And to Sam, is, is, is yeah. trade with Iran much too early? Is it something that should be pursued as part of confidence building? How do you think Emiratis think about it? Look, uh, Joe. I mean, I, I would say from my point of view, even the maximum pressure by, uh, by Trump administration did not work. I mean, did not prevent Iran from 
uh, developing its, its uh, capabilities. I mean, uh, the regime is still strong, uh, providing its uh, proxies, uh, the Houthis, the Hezbollah, uh, Asaib al haqar all Hajj in Iran. Still, they are doing what they are doing. So, but of course, this government will not say it publicly that don't remove the sanctions. But removing the sanctions without Iranian doing something vis-a-vis -vis that, it will be a great mistake from my point of view, okay? Now, and there is something else that the Iranian, there is two, two, two issues now, returning to the negotiation and returning to the deal. Iranian wants to return the, to the negotiation, but they don't want to return the same deal. The IRGC and Khamenei, they think this is not a fair deal. And they want a deal which acknowledge their enrichment from 20%. Now, there is another issue. Now, we are talking about Iran on the threshold, <laughs> nuclear threshold, with 60% uh, centrifuges. You have, you have different factor on the ground now with you will negotiate with Iran based on what? You will lift the sanction based on what? Iran with 60% centrifuges? Okay, this is, of course, it's not pleasing the Arab Gulf. Uh, Martin uh, said that uh, the nuclear uh, program is not uh, important more than the Iranian uh, malign activities and may, maybe basically the missile. The range of the missile, it is worrying us, okay? When you have this long range of missile, it's more worrying than the nuclear capabilities where all of the world are concentrating on the nuclear capabilities and leaving that which is also more dangerous uh, for the Gulf is weakening the neighborhood in Iraq and Yemen and Lebanon, everywhere Iran is surrounding you. That's what I'm saying that here you need the regional dialogue with Iran because this is the issue which you are worrying. And this is the track, I'm talking about two tracks, the track of nuclear capabilities or uh, program, and the other track should be go on the regional, which discussing the missiles and, and the malign uh, activities. Of course, it's worrying us, but lifting the sanction without any step from the Iranian, this is a, a, a great mistake. I don't John, 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 lifting the sanctions that John, Iran is doing anything. I, 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 John, can I make a quick point? Because I, I mentioned to you earlier that as as uh, as important as a regional security dialogue is, I'm still not a huge believer that it could be achieved anytime soon, frankly, because of some significant structural problems here, right? Uh, uh, and some significant differences of perspectives among the major parties here. Um, I don't know what really happened uh, between the Saudis and the Iranians allegedly in Baghdad. I don't know how serious those talks were. I don't know how high level they were. I mean, one of the Saudi officials mentioned, even denied they even took place. Maybe that Saudi official wasn't clear about what his Intel colleagues were doing and he wasn't briefed on those, fair enough. But the point being is that the predominant narrative of the Saudis for many, many years has been, why should we even bother talking to the Iranians when they're the ones aggressing us? You know, uh, you mentioned the gun pointing to your head, stop pointing the gun and then we'll come and talk to you. That has been the predominant Saudi narrative. And so you wanna tell me all of a sudden they've given up on that and they're actually willing to talk to the Iranians. I'm not entirely sure that this is really what is taking place here. And I don't know, uh, uh, whether uh, the talks were significant and serious enough to address issues that Ifti Sam is talking about here, whether it's missiles or anything else. Probably if they actually did take place, maybe some, um, you know, uh, breaking some ice or anything like that. But uh, it's, it, is, it is very unlikely that the Saudis have now come up with a newfound appreciation of the importance of holding talks with the Iranians when they're feeling so vulnerable, as Ibti Sam said before, and when they're so, uh, 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 they're recognizing that the balance of power between the two, especially if we're not going to be on the side of the Saudis, holding their hand and helping them out and providing them with a security commitment, they're not gonna do that alone with the Iranians. 
one not insignificant factor, John, that nobody really um, has paid much attention to when it comes to such complex negotiations, whether it's about ranges, whether it's about payloads, whether it's about dual use technologies, let's be very honest, the Saudis don't have that kind of specialized knowledge. Their diplomats have never really entered into complex negotiations with anybody. We've always been the one to provide them with security. We've always been the one to take care of these difficult issues with our presence in Saudi, with our security commitment, which obviously now is questionable. The Iranians have been talking to us in the world for many, many years. Their diplomats are seasoned. They have technical experts who understand centrifuges, who understand all sorts of issues that actually should be talked about now in ways like the Saudis don't have that kind of knowledge. So if they were to enter into negotiations with the Saudis and we're not involved and we're not in the back feeding them with specialized information, the Iranians are going to have them for breakfast. It's, it's, it's so imbalanced, both strategically speaking, but also from a knowledge base perspective that the Iranians would definitely have the upper hand. I, I think we all agree that, that this was not the, 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 the big thing, but I think, you know, Martin, you, you've been involved in any number of initial diplomatic steps to engage adversaries, to explore. You've known a lot about intelligence chiefs meeting and trying to see if there's a small confidence building step that could be taken. How did you read the news that the Saudi intelligence chief was supposedly in Baghdad talking to the Iranians? Did you interpret that as something that was likely limited to Iraq, something that was intended to break the ice, the beginning of a confidence building step. I mean, given your tremendous experience at senior levels of the US government, how, how did you read that news? So uh, it's not the first time that the Saudis and the Iranians have been reported to have met. Iraqis uh, held a meeting I think, I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was certainly last year, there were reports of such meetings. And uh, I think that it uh, has, in this case, probably more to do with Yemen um, than uh, some of the other issues. Uh, Bill Al has, a, has a, I think, an important point about Saudi capabilities, but I think he underestimates the ability of these neighbors over many, many years um, to work out motives for Vendis when they decide that they want to do that. Um, and we saw it uh, back in the 1990s when I was in the Clinton administration, when the Saudis and the Iranians uh, had a real problem with uh, Iranian uh, pilgrims uh, coming for the Hajj. Uh, and they found a way to sort out uh, their differences without reference to us. Now, you can say it's not the same thing. That's true. But it's not as if they haven't talked to each other before. Um, and I do think that that uh, precisely because the United States is not as reliable as it used to be. Uh, and it wasn't ever that reliable as far as they were concerned. But, but as a last resort, they were prepared to depend on us. I don't think they can even now feel that they can depend on us in the last resort. And uh, that means that they're going to find ways to talk to their neighbors. I think that Ebtisam has, has a good point about the need for a regional dialogue. I think we should get behind it. I think that, that the GCC states, all of them, um, have their own ways of talking to the Iranians, are doing so bilaterally. Um, and uh, it makes sense because our focus is on the nuclear file and their focus is on the regional disruption. And when we go back to the JCPOA, the sanctions will be lifted and there will suddenly be another infusion of a large amount of money that the Iranians can use to fuel their regional ambitions. That's what the Gulf states saw the last time the JCPOA deal was done. That's what they fear is going to happen now in short order. And so I think it, it makes a lot of sense because the interests are different here for the uh, local 
parties to engage directly with the Iranians and for us to support that, even to have a support group uh, of external powers to support them. And is there uh, any really role in a regional security dialogue? Yes, okay. I think that, that that should be part of the objective. <coughs> Excuse me, but, but you can't do it now. Um, over time, it's the kind of regional security dialogue that we want to have with the Israelis and the Iranians um, and, uh, as part of the architecture. But uh, that, that, that will have to wait. The fact that there's such strong interaction now between the Israelis and the Sunni Arabs is, is a good, lays a good foundation for eventually building that framework. Is there anything that has to be done now to, to lay the foundation for Israeli engagement? Is there any, given that that's the, the objective? I think that that would only complicate it at this point. But I, but I. Here's something that's unclear to me, Martin, and uh, Ibtisam, uh, in case you have thoughts on this. So it's obvious what the Saudis want from the Iranians if they were to talk to them, right? It's obvious what compromises they want them to make, what extract, what concessions they want to extract from them. But really, it's unclear to me, and this is an honest question, what the Iranians want from the Saudis. I think the party they want to negotiate with is the Americans. It's not the Saudis. The, the one thing that Amer the Iranians would want from the Saudis is for them to get up the give up the relationship with the Americans or not to entertain uh, normalizing with the Israelis. What is it that the Saudis provide to the Iranians that would be of strategic significance to the Iranians? What is it? When we talk about non-aggression pacts that the Iranians have proposed lately, right? Whether it's the uh, Zarif Hope Initiative, uh, it's something along the lines of what the Europeans had uh, back in the day. Who's aggressing whom here? What kind of concessions would the Saudis give to the Iranians? Well, uh, may I, John? Hey, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, look, Bilal. Uh, um, Iran's openness to dialogue with Arab during the maximum pressure campaign was an attempt to undermine the sanction regime and find um, an alternative to evade sitting on the table for comprehensive talk with the Trump administration. Now, Tehran has stopped this effort due to, to optimism in Tehran after the democratic victory in uh, in uh, US presidential election. But this optimism has soon declined due uh, to obstacles on the way of returning to di diplomacy. Expectation of the uh, potential positive consequences of Biden's victory have declined due to rigid position by the two sides on how to return to the nuclear agreement. They're conflicting a perspective on uh, expanding the uh, agreement and European support for Washington stand, all of this has led Tehran to resume talk about the need for dialogue with Arab neighbors. If you remember Zarif uh, at that time, what he said, we are open to uh, a regional dialogue. And he also, in another occasion, he mentioned that they are also open to discuss uh, the Yemeni issue. So when there is a detent that might initiate dialogue with the West, Iran behaves arrogantly towards its neighbors and rush to its neighbors when the doors are shut with the West, uh, or Tehran faces a huge obstacle. That's what the point. Tehran wants, the, Tehran, the Iranian wants the economic cooperation, but they yeah. want without Paying anything without uh, without any conditions, they will continue their activities, expansionists, their missiles, uh, developing their uh, missiles, their nuclear capabilities. But and this is what happened under um, Rafsanjan with the Saudi. Okay, this time they want that. They want also the security of waterways. Okay. But they don't want to give anything vis-a-vis -vis that. And the, the, the main uh, uh, goals in, in my suggestion of a regional dialogue, which I think 
It is the time now, not later, Martin. Now we have to put two tracks. This track on nuclear capabilities negotiation, and we have now, but with the guarantor from United States or other major uh, uh, international powers and UN under uh, say we use the snapback uh, policy. This is the time. Otherwise, if the Iran uh, succeed in getting another nuclear deal, Iran will not will not accept any regional dialogue with its uh, adversary. And by the way, uh, the Saudi they talk about the Yemen in, in Iraq. Okay, and I think this is weaken their position because this is what Iran wants bilateral. They don't want that multilateral dialogue. And when I uh, meant that, why the, the weakness of those initiatives by Kuwaiti and Qatari? Because nor Kuwaiti, neither Qataris are adversaries for Iran. Iran mainly wants UAE and Saudi to uh, be on the table to negotiate. And what I'm saying, without US, without UN, the any agreement will not yield anything for our for the sake of UAE or uh, Saudi. There should be a guarantor, an international guarantor there. So, so I, I just want to correct John one thing at the sum. I, I agree with you. I think this is exactly the right thing to do now. I was talking about when to bring Israel into the regional dialogue. Yeah. Because I think to try to bring Israel in now will make it impossible. But definitely. I think you're right that the GCC should engage with the Iranians now, and we should support that. Yeah. Now, let me let me try to, to raise an issue that Ibtissam raised at the beginning, which is that, that there needs to be this negotiation to find a solution to the impasse, as she described it, to deal with the outstanding issues. My sense is Israel doesn't think there's a solution to the impasse. The problem is the nature of the government of the Islamic Republic. It is the, the strategic commitment of the Islamic Republic to hostility toward Israel. And there's really no solution. You might argue that the Iranian view is there's no hostility. There's no solution to the hostility with the West, that the West is unalterably opposed to the Islamic Republic merely for what it is. And the solution forward is being in this constant state of negotiations where Iran continues to threaten to bully and to try to extract uh, concessions in exchange for limiting some of its actions. And then you come to the position of the Gulf states, which say the Iranians have been there forever. The Iranians will be there forever. Maybe if we can have the US and other parties on our side, we can try to, to limit some of this, but we can't solve it. I still remember talking to a, one of the senior leaders in the UAE about Sunni Shia tensions. And he said, you don't understand. The Iranians have only been Shia for 500 years. And they've been Iranians, they've been Persians for millennia. And so it seems to me that, that, that one of the really important pieces of this problem to untie is what does is, what is success look like? I think the Israeli sense is there really isn't success. This is long term. I sense from an Iranian perspective, there's no sense of success. There's long term. I sense it may be a view from the Gulf perspective that there's no success. It's long term. And the only people thinking about success are American strategists who are ready to move on to other issues. I mean, is that fair? I mean, how, how, do, how do each of you see the different parties thinking about success? What's the horizon? At what point can you declare victory in this very complicated diplomatic skirmish? Um, shall I go first? Yeah, sure. I think, I think that, that uh, success from an American uh, point of view is uh, very much a, a an arrangement, an agreement that prevents Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons and over time 
uh, brings Iran back into the Westphalian system of states as, as a country that has more of an interest in maintaining order than creating a chaos and revolution. Um, so that's what success looks like from an American point of view. From an Israeli point of view, um, there's no, I think you're right, there's no expectation that the Iranians are ever going to uh, revert to uh, the way that they were when the Israelis had very good relations with the Shah, uh, just a kind of normal regional power. Their assumption is that revolution will go on you know, forever uh, unless we use such means as maximum pressure and other things to bring the regime to its knees. But since it didn't work this time around uh, with Trump, I don't think they have a, a much expectation that it's going to work in any reasonable time frame. And so their basic attitude is mow the grass, just keep the Iranians as far away from the nuclear weapons capability as possible, counter, contain, counter, and roll back their activities in the region as much as can be done, uh, and, and just continue the battle. And in that regard, they feel that they've made uh, great progress and, and they fear that what we do, what the United States does, will actually boost the Iranians uh, against them. A fear that I think um, their new Arab, Sunni Arab allies uh, agree with. Pretty well. Yeah, this is not a problem to be solved. This is a problem to be managed, at least as far as how the Gulf states uh, see it. And obviously, I'd love to hear what Abdesam says. You know, the, the success for them really is to achieve uh, potent deterrent. That's what it is. You know, they don't want to see another app kick. They don't want to see something uh, along the lines of increased political uh, subversion that would threaten the survival of those uh, regimes. So what they've always tried to do is to acquire the turret. And they're not there yet. They're trying their best with the Israelis. Uh, but that is what success looks to them, at least from a military point of view. And, and what's your sense of the Iranian endgame, if any? I mean, knowing what you know about the, the targets of Iran, what, 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 as you look at how the targets have responded to Iran, do you have so, any sense of what the Iranians really want to do? You know, we could spend another seven hours about what the Iranians want in the region, but uh, they've been pretty, uh, you know, uh, straightforward and quite explicit about their desires that they uh, want to, to the extent possible, reduce and ideally eliminate America's military presence in the region so that they can actually uh, dominate it and uh, pursue their preferences. Now, are they, are they, will they ever get there? I don't know. But, uh, you know, the, we should take seriously words like that. When Zarif tweets that the problem is the West and the Europeans, we don't need them to enter into a regional security dialogue. They are the problem. In caps, when he puts them on Twitter, I have no reason but to believe him. And Mon's right. When the, Isra when the Iranians say that we are committed to the destruction of the state of Israel, why shouldn't I believe him? Those are very serious words. And it's the same about their... Uh, designs and aspirations in the region. They want to dominate because they see that uh, the neighborhood minus Israel is much weaker and ripe for domination. It's that simple. After Sam, you live in Dubai. Do you feel there's a, an Iranian design to dominate the region? Look, uh, John, this is the regional project of the Iranian. This is the geopolitical project of the Iranian. Now, yeah, we are talking, it's not, a, it's not something, an easy issue. This is based on weakening the neighborhood by using the sectarian card. I heard some speaker call that they are minority in, in a, 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 between a huge Sunni community. It's not that, it's not Sunni and Shia in the region. This is simplifying the issue. There is a geopolitical project by the Iranian using the sectarian card to weakening the, the neighborhood. This happened in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen, we're everywhere. They are using whatever tools, cultural tools. It's, I mean, now it's not easy. If you look between the struggle between the Iranian and Israeli in Syria, Okay, it's not about you can just strike militarily. How can you get them from Syria culturally? How can you get them there from Iraq? 
this is this is the the dangerous which I'm tool the Iranian using. Now other the other tools the the military capabilities nuclear uh, missiles. So it's we are in front of project. Now how to solve this? How can you bring Iran to a normal state? uh respecting the international law okay now we are i don't think how to make it win-win situation now with iran pivoting towards china i think it's very complicated now with the chinese offering also their initiative which is making it more complicated this regional is involving the palestinian israeli issue involving the, the many issues in the region it's not easy now and you have the IRGC coming through the presidential election. It shows that those conservatives are going to control, control Iran. So I don't think uh, uh, we are in front a normal state near in, in the near uh, future. Um, we are, I think, more confronting a regime. Uh, they are based on their uh, relation with China they are fee, feel that they are emboldened more to confront the West and to confront uh, Israeli and their uh, neighbors. I, I don't think it's an, an easy issue now, uh, <laughs> Joe. If the, if the issues were easy, they wouldn't need us. Let me, let me go to Martin, because we have a question in the chat about uh, sort of the origins of Israeli-Iranian tensions. And it seems to me that that the issue of, of sort of Iranian aspirations for hegemony are partly tied to the revolution and partly Iran's own imperial memory of itself. But it also seems to me that, that Iran is uniquely poorly qualified to, to dominate the Middle East. It's a country with a GDP the size of the state of Maryland. Their air force was mainly supplied under the Shah in the 1970s. Uh, they have, you know, what, 84 million people uh, compared to an Arab region of, of 400 million people. Why, why would Iranians, in your judgment, think that, that, that regional hegemony is A, a, re a reasonable target, B, within their reach, and what part of any of this has to do with the Islamic revolution and what part of it is just a, a normal uh, uh, sense of Iranian aggrandizement in your view. It's taking you back to your graduate studies, I'm afraid. <laughs> so um, I think you make a very good point and it's very important to uh, put this all in that kind of perspective. Iran has gone a long way uh, by exploiting the cracks and fissures within the Sunni world and has been able to take advantage of Shia populations, uh, Shia minorities in the Sunni world to advance their agenda. Uh, and, and as the Sunni world, Sunni states have, have faced their own profound problems as we saw in the Arab Spring and the revolutions and the civil wars and so on, the Iranians have been able to take advantage of that. Uh, they've also been a, give, given a great boost by American missteps, in particular in Iraq, which kind of opened the gates of Babylon to the Iranians. And, and that gave them a huge, a real turbo boost in terms of uh, their objectives in the region. They were able to exercise considerable influence, in some ways a dominant influence in Iraq. Uh, so uh, they, they've been able to play a weak hand very well, not just because they're skillful, but because we've all made bad mistakes and because there's a, these structural uh, issues which they've been able to exploit. And it's hard to see how that's going to change in the near future. Uh, so that even when they are heavily under economic pressure and heavily constrained, their abilities to, to create problems in the region have not 
decline. As much as Secretary of State Pompeo pushed this argument that we're going to kind of remove every Iranian boot from Syria, he's gone and they're still there. And uh, that's, you know, just, just, I think, the reality. So the question is, how can you deal with those structural uh, problems? Uh, how can Arab states deal better with their Shia population so that they can't be exploited by the Iranians? That's a kind of long-term challenge. But that's part of the challenge here, is to reduce their ability for troublemaking uh, in, the, in the Sunni heartland. And then, John, I think, yeah, and then the question I want to close on, because we're, we're running out of time, uh, is this issue, if Iran is a major spoiler, are there any concerns about U.S. partners in the region being spoilers of U.S. designs through the JCPOA or other kinds of arrangements with Iran? I mean, we've talked about Iran as a spoiler. Is there any possibility, any concern about our partners in the region being spoilers of our designs, not just the Iranians being spoilers of the, of the region's designs? No, spoiler of what? Of what, John? I, I mean, who intervened? Iranian, when they put, uh, stop the aggression, who's, who's aggressive in their, in their policies? Who interfere in the other's uh, uh, affairs? Okay, who used the sectarian card? It's not us, I don't think, no, they want to reach, look, they are not against reaching any agreement between US and Iran, and Iran any deal. They are against not to be there, not to be involved, okay? And now look to the Vienna discussion. You didn't call, I mean, the US did not call anybody from the GCC to be there on the table, at least monitoring what's happening. This is cause, uh, uh, they are upset of that. Maybe the Saudi went to talk to the Iranian and Iraq because they are upset from the, they tried to be in Vienna and they couldn't. And you didn't allow them to be there. So they thought that why not to take a direct uh, talk with the Iranian instead of waiting to take the approval from uh, from US. So this is the problem with, with you. I am talking about US as a Gulfist because we are your allies but when it comes to Iran, we are not there. You are neglecting us. We, we, this is the, the region where we both, Iran and us, we are there. So we have to be part of that negotiation. And I, I think, you know, we've talked about Israel as a spoiler, but, but Epsom's point is, is well taken. And these, you know, at least the Israelis feel that they are being consulted. Uh, they, uh, felt that they had been betrayed the last time around. And I think Eptasam is, is kind of expressing that sense of betrayal uh, on the part of the uh, Gulf Arab allies. The Israelis don't have basis for complaining about that. Um, we are kind of hugging them as much as we can uh, as we go forward with this. And they are, they have a desire to be the spoiler if they feel that, that we're weak and going too far towards Iranians, but they also are concerned about maintaining the relationship with the United States. So that there's a limit to how far they're prepared to go as long as we do not take them for granted or betray them. You know, you get the last word. Uh, so look, this is my final shot, John, to pour cold water on this idea of a regional security dialogue as much as I am in favor of it once again. But what I just heard from Ibtisam is fantastic, and I really want to thank her for that point, is that what the Iranians are looking for, which is something I've been trying to understand, is to reduce or eliminate the sanctions, right? And so to get their money back. But what the Gulf states want is concessions on security. So you could see how massively dislocated that dialogue is. If, if, if I'm Iran and I'm not threatened, my security is not threatened by the Gulf states, you could see why I'm not going to concede a whole lot on security issues. It's like they're talking apples and oranges. And so if there is no symmetry on the issues themselves, the, on the topics of negotiation, you could already see why that dialogue has a ceiling and it's not going to be as significant as any other typical security dialogue you see in the world and in, the reg and in other regions of the world. So because they want very different things, it's hard to see something like this as being meaningful and as reducing the temperature in the region and as pacifying the region. 
although arguably it's not totally different because they're still in the produce section of the supermarket. Okay, fair Apple enough. Oranges, but still in the produce section. Fair enough. Um, I want to thank Martin and Ibtisam and Bilal for a very thoughtful discussion. And uh, Mike, over to you. Thank you. And uh, I just want to echo that uh, for the three panelists. Uh, it was it was absolutely what we were looking for uh, with respect to not only challenging our assumptions, uh, our perspective in the region, but and presenting a, another uh, perspective, but quite frankly, challenging each other and having that honest dialogue that was uh, very thoughtful. Um, and John, I certainly want to thank you for your expert modera uh, moderation uh, for uh, and keeping things uh, moving forward. Um, just uh, for a timeline for everyone, we are going to take a, a, a short break um, at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we'll have uh, three of our students that will be making uh, uh, presentations. We hope that uh, you'll be able to uh, participate in that. And then the, uh, the rest of the, the panel um, will begin at 1.30, again, Eastern Standard Time. And that time we'll be looking at uh, the China uh, perspective, the uh, uh, Chinese perspective, the Russian perspective, as well as the uh, EU uh, perspective. So we look forward to uh, having everybody uh, rejoin us. And thank you again um, for this uh, wonderful panel.